Chapter Six, Part One of the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Reader, Michael Armenta. Chapter Six: Difficulties of the Theory of Descent with Modification absence or rarity of transitional varieties transitions in habits of life diversified habits in the same species species with habits widely different from those of their allies organs of extreme perfection modes of transition cases of difficulty natura non facit saltum organs of small importance organs not in all cases absolutely perfect the law of unity of type and of the conditions of existence embraced by the theory of the natural selection long before the reader has arrived at this part of my work a crowd of difficulties will have occurred to him some of them are so serious that to this day i can hardly reflect on them without being in some degree staggered but to the best of my judgment the greater number are only apparent and those that are real are not i think fatal to the theory these difficulties and objections may be classed under the following heads first why if species have descended from other species by fine gradations do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being as we see them well defined secondly is it possible that an animal having for instance the structure and habits of a bat could have been formed by the modification of some other animal with widely different habits and structure can we believe that natural selection could produce on the one hand an organ of trifling importance such as the tail of a giraffe which serves as a fly flapper and on the other hand an organ so wonderful as the eye thirdly can instincts be acquired and modified through natural selection what shall we say to the instinct which leads the bee to make cells and which has practically anticipated the discoveries of profound mathematicians fourthly how can we account for species when crossed being sterile and producing sterile offspring whereas when varieties are crossed their fertility is unimpaired the first two heads will be here discussed some miscellaneous objections in the following chapter instinct and hybridism in the two succeeding chapters on the absence of rarity of transitional varieties as natural selection acts solely by the preservation of profitable modifications each new form will tend in a fully stocked country to take the place of and finally to exterminate its own less improved parent form and other less favoured forms with which it comes into competition thus extinction and natural selection go hand in hand hence if we look at each species as descended from some unknown form both the parent and all the transitional varieties will generally have been exterminated by the very process of the formation and perfection of the new form but as by this theory innumerable transitional forms must have existed why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth it will be more convenient to discuss this question in the chapter on the imperfection of the geological record and i will here only state that i believe the answer mainly lies in the record being incomparably less perfect than is generally supposed the crust of the earth is a vast museum but the natural collections have been imperfectly made and only at long intervals of time but it may be urged that when several closely allied species inhabit the same territory we surely ought to find at the present time many transitional forms let us take a simple case in travelling from north to south over a continent we generally meet at successive intervals with closely allied or representative species evidently filling nearly the same place in the natural economy of the land 
these representative species often meet and interlock and as the one becomes rarer and rarer the other becomes more and more frequent till the one replaces the other but if we compare these species where they intermingle they are generally as absolutely distinct from each other in every detail of structure as are specimens taken from the metropolis inhabited by each by my theory these allied species are descended from a common parent and during the process of modification each has become adapted to the conditions of life of its own region and has supplanted and exterminated its original parent form and all the transitional varieties between its past and present states hence we ought not to expect at the present time to meet with numerous transitional varieties in each reason though they must have existed there and may be embedded there in a fossil condition but in the intermediate region having intermediate conditions of life why do we not now find closely linking intermediate varieties this difficulty for a long time quite confounded me but i think it can be in large part explained in the first place we should be extremely cautious in inferring because an area is now continuous that it has been continuous during a long period geology would lead us to believe that most continents have been broken up into islands even during the later tertiary periods and in such islands distinct species might have been separately formed without the possibility of intermediate varieties existing in the intermediate zones by changes in the form of the land and of climate marine areas now continuous must often have existed within recent times in a far less continuous and uniform condition than at present but i will pass over this way of escaping from the difficulty for i believe that many perfectly defined species have been formed on strictly continuous areas though i do not doubt that the formerly broken condition of area now continuous has played an important part in the formation of new species more especially with freely crossing and wandering animals in looking at species as they are now distributed over a wide area we generally find them tolerably numerous over a large territory then becoming somewhat abruptly rarer and rarer on the confines and finally disappearing hence the neutral territory between two representative species is generally narrow in comparison with the territory proper to each we see the same fact in ascending mountains and sometimes it is quite remarkable how abruptly as adolphe candle has observed a common alpine species disappears the same fact has been noticed by e forbes in sounding the depths of the sea with the dredge to those who look at climate and the physical conditions of life as the all-important elements of distribution these facts ought to cause surprise as climate and height or depth graduate away insensibly but when we bear in mind that almost every species even in its metropolis would increase immensely in numbers were it not for other competing species that nearly all either prey on or serve as prey for others in short that each organic being is either directly or indirectly related in the most important manner to other organic beings we see that the range of the inhabitants of any country by no means exclusively depends on insensibly changing physical conditions but in large part on the presence of other species on which it lives or by which it is destroyed or with which it comes into competition and as these species are already defined objects not blending one into another by insensible gradations the range of any one species depending as it does on the range of others will tend to be sharply defined moreover each species on the confines of its range where it exists in lessened numbers will during fluctuations in the number of its enemies or of its prey or in the nature of the seasons be extremely liable to utter extermination and thus its geographical range will come to be still more sharply defined
as allied or representative species when inhabiting a continuous area are generally distributed in such a manner that each has a wide range with a comparatively narrow neutral territory between them in which they become rather suddenly rarer and rarer then as varieties do not essentially differ from species the same rule will probably apply to both and if we take a varying species inhabiting a very large area we shall have to adapt two varieties to two large areas and a third variety to a narrow intermediate zone the intermediate variety consequently will exist in lesser numbers from inhabiting a narrow and lesser area and practically as far as i can make out this rule holds good with varieties in a state of nature i have met with striking instances of the rule in the case of varieties intermediate between well-marked varieties in the genus balanus and it would appear from information given me by mr watson dr asa gray and mr wollaston that generally when varieties intermediate between two other forms occur they are much rarer numerically than the forms which they connect now if we may trust these facts and inferences and conclude that varieties linking two other varieties together generally have existed in lesser numbers than the forms which they connect then we can understand why intermediate varieties should not endure for very long periods why as a general rule they should be exterminated and disappear sooner than the forms which they originally linked together for any form existing in lesser numbers would as already remarked run a greater chance of being exterminated than one existing in large numbers and in this particular case the intermediate form would be eminently liable to the inroads of closely allied forms existing on both sides of it but it is a far more important consideration that during the process of further modification by which two varieties are supposed to be converted and perfected into two distinct species the two which exist in larger numbers from inhabiting larger areas will have a great advantage over the intermediate variety which exists in smaller numbers in a narrow and intermediate zone for forms existing in larger numbers will have a better chance within any given period of presenting further favorable variations for natural selection to seize on than will the rarer forms which exist in lesser numbers hence the more common forms in the race for life will tend to beat and supplant the less common forms for these will be more slowly modified and improved it is the same principle which as i believe accounts for the common species in each country as shown in the second chapter presenting on an average a greater number of well-marked varieties than do the rarer species i may illustrate what i mean by supposing three varieties of sheep to be kept one adapted to an extensive mountain region a second to a comparatively narrow hilly tract and a third to the wide plains at the base and that the inhabitants are all trying with equal steadiness and skill to improve their stocks by selection the chances in this case will be strongly in favor of the great holders on the mountains or on the plains improving their breeds more quickly than the small holders on the intermediate narrow hilly tract and consequently the improved mountain or plain breed will soon take the place of the less improved hill breed and thus the two breeds which originally existed in greater numbers will come into close contact with each other without the interposition of the supplanted intermediate hill variety to sum up i believe that species come to be tolerably well defined objects and do not at any one period present an inextricable chaos of varying and intermediate links first because new varieties are very slowly formed for variation is a slow process and natural selection can do nothing until favorable individual differences or variations occur 
and until a place in the natural polity of the country can be better filled by some modification of some one or more of its inhabitants and such new places will depend on slow changes of climate or on the occasional immigration of new inhabitants and probably in a still more important degree on some of the old inhabitants becoming slowly modified with the new forms thus produced and the old ones acting and reacting on each other so that in any one region and at any one time we ought to see only a few species presenting slight modifications of structure in some degree permanent and this assuredly we do see secondly areas now continuous must often have existed within the recent period as isolated portions in which many forms more especially among the classes which unite for each birth and wander much may have separately been rendered sufficiently distinct to rank as representative species in this case intermediate varieties between the several representative species and their common parent must formerly have existed within each isolated portion of the land but these links during the process of natural selection will have been supplanted and exterminated so that they will no longer be found in a living state thirdly when two or more varieties have been formed in different portions of a strictly continuous area intermediate varieties will it is probable at first have been formed in the intermediate zones but they will generally have had a short duration for these intermediate varieties will from reasons already assigned namely from what we know of the actual distribution of closely allied or representative species and likewise of acknowledged varieties exist in the intermediate zones in lesser numbers than the varieties which they tend to connect from this cause alone the intermediate varieties will be liable to accidental extermination and during the process of further modification through natural selection they will almost certainly be beaten and supplanted by the forms which they connect for these from existing in greater numbers will in the aggregate present more varieties and thus be further improved through natural selection and gain further advantages lastly looking not to any one time but at all time if my theory be true numberless intermediate varieties linking closely together all the species of the same group must assuredly have existed but the very process of natural selection constantly tends as has been so often remarked to exterminate the parent forms and the intermediate links consequently evidence of their former existence could be found only among fossil remains which are preserved as we shall attempt to show in a future chapter in an extremely imperfect and intermittent record on the origin and transition of organic beings with peculiar habits and structure it has been asked by the opponents of such views as i hold how for instance could a land carnivorous animal have been converted into one with aquatic habits for how could the animal in its transitional state have subsisted it would be easy to show that there now exist carnivorous animals presenting close intermediate grades from strictly terrestrial to aquatic habits and as each exists by a struggle for life it is clear that each must be well adapted to its place in nature look at the mustela bison of north america which has webbed feet and which resembles an otter in its fur short legs and form of tail during summer this animal dives for and preys on fish but during the long winter it leaves the frozen waters and preys like other polecats on mice and land animals if a different case had been taken and it had been asked how an insectivorous quadruped could possibly have been converted into a flying bat the question would have been far more difficult to answer yet i think such difficulties have little weight here as on other occasions 
I lie under a heavy disadvantage. For out of the many striking cases which I have collected, I can give only one or two instances of transitional habits and structures in allied species, and of diversified habits, either constant or occasional in the same species. And it seems to me that nothing less than a long list of such cases is sufficient to lessen the difficulty in any particular case like that of the bat. Look at the family of squirrels. Here we have the finest gradation from animals, with their tails only slightly flattened, and from others, as Sir J. Richardson has remarked, with the posterior part of their bodies rather wide, and with skin on their flanks rather full, to the so-called flying squirrels. And flying squirrels have their limbs, and even the base of the tail, united by a broad expanse of skin, which serves as a parachute and allows them to glide through the air to an astonishing distance from tree to tree. We cannot doubt that each structure is of use to each kind of squirrel in its own country by enabling it to escape birds or beasts of prey, or to collect food more quickly, or, as there is reason to believe, to lessen the danger from occasional falls. But it does not follow from this fact that the structure of each squirrel is the best that it is possible to conceive under all possible conditions. Let the climate and vegetation change, let other competing rodents or new beasts of prey immigrate, or old ones become modified, and all analogy would lead us to believe that some, at least, of the squirrels would decrease in numbers or become exterminated unless they also become modified and improved in structure in a corresponding manner. Therefore, I can see no difficulty, nor especially under changing conditions of life, in the continued preservation of individuals with fuller and fuller flank membranes, each modification being useful, each being propagated, until, by the accumulated effects of this process of natural selection, a perfect so-called flying squirrel was produced. Now, look at the Galeopithecus, or so-called flying lemur, which was formerly ranked among bats, but is now believed to belong to the insectivora. An extremely wide flank membrane stretches from the corners of the jaw to the tail, and includes the limbs with the elongated fingers. This flank membrane is furnished with an extensor muscle. Although no graduated links of structure, fitted for gliding through the air, now connect the Galeopithecus with the other insectivora, yet there is no difficulty in supposing that such links formerly existed, and that each was developed in the same manner as with the less perfectly gliding squirrels, each grade of structure having been useful to its possessor nor can I see any insuperable difficulty in further believing it possible that the membrane-connected fingers and forearm of the Galeopithecus might have been greatly lengthened by natural selection, and this, as far as the organs of flight are concerned, would have converted the animal into a bat. In certain bats, in which the wing membrane extends from the top of the shoulder to the tail and includes the hind legs, we perhaps see traces of an apparatus originally fitted for gliding through the air rather than for flight. If about a dozen genera of birds were to become extinct, who would have ventured to surmise that birds might have existed which use their wings solely as flappers, like the logger-headed duck, Micropterus of Eton, as fins in the water and as front legs on the land, like the penguin, as sails, like the ostrich, and functionally for no purpose, like the opteryx. Yet the structure of each of these birds is good for it, under the conditions of life to which it is exposed, for each has to live by a struggle. But it is not necessarily the best possible under all possible conditions. It must not be inferred from these remarks that any of the grades of wing structure here alluded to which perhaps may all be the result of disuse, indicate the steps by which birds actually acquired their perfect power of flight, but they serve to show what diversified means of transition are at least possible. 
seeing that a few members of such water-breathing classes as the crustacea and mollusca are adapted to live on the land and seeing that we have flying birds and mammals flying insects of the most diversified types and formerly had flying reptiles it is conceivable that flying fish which now glide far through the air slightly rising and turning by the aid of their fluttering fins might have been modified into perfectly winged animals if this had been effected who would ever have imagined that in an early transitional state they had been inhabitants of the open ocean and had used their incipient organs of flight exclusively so far as we know to escape being devoured by other fish when we see any structure highly perfected for any particular habit as the wings of a bird for flight we should bear in mind that animals displaying early transitional grades of the structure will seldom have survived to the present day for they will have been supplanted by their successors which were gradually rendered more perfect through natural selection furthermore we may conclude that transitional states between structures fitted for very different habits of life will rarely have been developed at an early period in great numbers and under many subordinate forms thus to return to our imaginary illustration of the flying fish it does not seem probable that fishes capable of true flight would have been developed under many subordinate forms for taking prey of many kinds in many ways on the land and in the water until their organs of flight had come to a high stage of perfection so as to have given them a decided advantage over other animals in the battle for life hence the chance of discovering species with transitional grades of structure in a fossil condition will always be less from their having existed in lesser numbers than in the case of species with fully developed structures i will now give two or three instances both of diversified and of changed habits in the individuals of the same species in either case it would be easy for natural selection to adapt the structure of the animal to its changed habits or exclusively to one of its several habits it is however difficult to decide and immaterial for us whether habits generally change first and structure afterwards or whether slight modifications of structure lead to changed habits both probably often occurring almost simultaneously of cases of changed habits it will suffice merely to allude to that of the many british insects which now feed on exotic plants or exclusively on artificial substances of diversified habits innumerable instances could be given i have often watched a tyrant flycatcher sarophagus sulfuratus in south america hovering over one spot and then proceeding to another like a kestrel and at other times standing stationary on the margin of water and then dashing into it like a kingfisher at a fish in our own country the larger titmouse parus major may be seen climbing branches almost like a creeper it sometimes like a shrike kills small birds by blows on the head and i have many times seen and heard it hammering the seeds of the yew on a branch and thus breaking them like a nuthatch in north america the black bear was seen by hearn swimming for hours with widely open mouth thus catching almost like a whale insects in the water as we sometimes see individuals following habits different from those proper to their species and to the other species of the same genus we might expect that such individuals would occasionally give rise to new species having anomalous habits and with their structure either slightly or considerably modified from that of their type and such instances occur in nature can a more striking instance of adaptation be given than that of a woodpecker for climbing trees and seizing insects in the chinks of the bark yet in north america there are woodpeckers which feed largely on fruit and others with elongated wings which chase insects on the wing on the plains of la plata where hardly a tree grows there is a woodpecker 
Colaptus Cabestris, which has two toes before and two behind, a long pointed tongue, pointed tail feathers, sufficiently stiff to support the bird in a vertical position on a post, but not so stiff as in the typical woodpeckers, and a straight long beak. The beak, however, is not so straight or so strong as in the typical woodpeckers, but it is strong enough to bore into wood. Hence this Colaptes, in all the essential parts of its structure, is a woodpecker. Even in such trifling characters as the colouring, the harsh tone of the voice, and undulatory flight, its close blood relationship to our common woodpecker is plainly declared, yet, as I can assert, not only from my own observations, but from those of the accurate Azara, in certain large districts it does not climb trees, and it makes its nest in holes in banks. In certain other districts, however, this same woodpecker, as Mr. Hudson states, frequents trees and bores holes in the trunk for its nest. I may mention, as another illustration of the varied habits of this genus, that a Mexican Colaptes has been described by de Sosue as boring holes into hard wood in order to lay up a store of acorns. Petrels are the most aerial and oceanic of birds, but in the quiet sounds of Tierra del Fuego, the Puffinuria berardi, in its general habits, in its astonishing power of diving, in its manner of swimming and of flying, when made to take flight, would be mistaken by any one for an auk or a grape. Nevertheless, it is essentially a petrel, but with many parts of its organization profoundly modified in relation to its new habits of life, whereas the woodpecker of La Plata has had its structure only slightly modified. In the case of the water ouzel, the acutest observer, by examining its dead body, would never have suspected its sub-aquatic habits. Yet this bird, which is allied to the thrush family, subsists by diving, using its wings under water and grasping stones with its feet. All the members of the great order of hymenopterous insects are terrestrial, excepting the genus Proctotrupes, which Sir John Lubbock has discovered to be aquatic in its habits. It often enters the water and dives about by the use not of its legs, but of its wings, and remains as long as four hours beneath the surface. Yet it exhibits no modification in structure in accordance with its abnormal habits. He who believes that each being has been created as we now see it must occasionally have felt surprise when he has met with an animal having habits and structure not in agreement. What can be plainer than that the webbed feet of ducks and geese are formed for swimming? Yet there are upland geese with webbed feet which rarely go near the water, and no one, except Audubon, has seen the frigate bird, which has all its four toes webbed, alight on the surface of the ocean. On the other hand, grabes and coots are eminently aquatic, although their toes are only bordered by membrane. What seems plainer than that of the long toes, not furnished with membrane, of the Gralatoris, are formed for walking over swamps and floating plants. The water hen and land rail are members of this order, yet the first is nearly as aquatic as the coot, and the second is nearly as terrestrial as the coil or partridge. In such cases, and many others could be given, habits have changed without a corresponding change of structure. The webbed feet of the upland goose may be said to have become almost rudimentary in function, though not in structure. In the frigate bird, the deeply scooped membrane between the toes shows that structure has begun to change. He who believes in separate and innumerable acts of creation may say, that in these cases it has pleased the Creator to cause a being of one type to take the place of one belonging to another type. But this seems to me only restating the fact in dignified language. He who believes in the struggle for existence, and in the principle of natural selection, 
will acknowledge that every organic being is constantly endeavouring to increase in numbers and that if any one being varies ever so little either in habits or structure and thus gains an advantage over some other inhabitant of the same country it will seize on the place of that inhabitant however different that may be from its own place hence it will cause him no surprise that there should be geese and frigate birds with webbed feet living on the dry land and rarely alighting on the water that there should be long-toed corncrakes living in meadows instead of in swamps that there should be woodpeckers where hardly a tree grows that there should be diving thrushes and diving hymenoptera and petrels with the habits of ox organs of extreme perfection and complication to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems i freely confess absurd in the highest degree when it was first said that the sun stood still and the world turned round the common sense of mankind declared the doctrine false but the old saying of vox populi vox dei as every philosopher knows cannot be trusted in science reason tells me that if numerous gradations from a simple and imperfect eye to one complex and perfect can be shown to exist each grade being useful to its possessor as is certainly the case if further the eye ever varies and the variations be inherited as is likewise certainly the case and if such variation should be useful to any animal under changing conditions of life then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection though insuperable by our imagination should not be considered as subversive of the theory how a nerve comes to be sensitive to light hardly concerns us more than how life itself originated but i may remark that as some of the lowest organisms in which nerves cannot be detected are capable of perceiving light it does not seem impossible that certain sensitive elements in their sarcode should become aggregated and developed into nerves endowed with this special sensibility in searching for the gradations through which an organ in any species has been perfected we ought to look exclusively to its lineal progenitors but this is scarcely ever possible and we are forced to look to other species and genera of the same group that is to the collateral descendants from the same parent form in order to see what gradations are possible and for the chance of some gradations having been transmitted in an unaltered or little altered condition but the state of the same organ in distinct classes may incidentally throw light on the steps by which it has been perfected the simplest organ which can be called an eye consists of an optic nerve surrounded by pigment cells and covered by translucent skin but without any lens or other refractive body we may however according to m jourdain descend even a step lower and find aggregates of pigment cells apparently serving as organs of vision without any nerves and resting merely on sarcotic tissue eyes of the above simple nature are not capable of distinct vision and serve only to distinguish light from darkness in certain starfishes small depressions in the layer of pigment which surrounds the nerve are filled as described by the author just quoted with transparent gelatinous matter projecting with a convex surface like the cornea in the higher animals he suggests that this serves not to form an image but only to concentrate the luminous rays and render their perception more easy in this concentration of the rays we gain the first and by far the most important step towards the formation of a true picture-forming eye for we have only to place the naked extremity of the optic nerve which in some of the lower animals lies deeply buried in the body and in some near the surface 
at the right distance from the concentrating apparatus, and an image will be formed on it. In the great class of the articulata, we may start from an optic nerve, simply coated with pigment, the latter sometimes forming a sort of pupil, but destitute of lens, or other optical contrivance. With insects it is now known that the numerous facets on the cornea of their great compound eyes form true lenses, and that the cones include curiously modified nervous filaments. But these organs in the articulata are so much diversified that Muller formerly made three main classes with seven subdivisions, besides a fourth main class of aggregated simple eyes. When we reflect on these facts, here given much too briefly, with respect to the wide, diversified, and graduated range of structure in the eyes of the lower animals, and when we bear in mind how small the number of all living forms must be in comparison with those which have become extinct, the difficulty ceases to be very great in believing that natural selection may have converted the simple apparatus of an optic nerve coated with pigment and invested by transparent membrane into an optical instrument as perfect as is possessed by any member of the articulata class. He who will go thus far ought not to hesitate to go one step further if he finds, on finishing this volume, that large bodies of facts, otherwise inexplicable, can be explained by the theory of modification through natural selection, he ought to admit that a structure even as perfect as an eagle's eye might thus be formed, although in this case he does not know the transitional states. It has been objected that in order to modify the eye and still preserve it as a perfect instrument, many changes would have to be effected simultaneously, which, it is assumed, could not be done through natural selection. But, as I have attempted to show in my work on the variation of domestic animals, it is not necessary to suppose that the modifications were all simultaneous if they were extremely slight and gradual. Different kinds of modification would also serve for the same general purpose, as Mr. Wallace has remarked, quote, If a lens has too short or too long a focus, it may be amended either by an alteration of curvature or an alteration of density. If the curvature be irregular, and the rays do not converge to a point, then any increased regularity of curvature will be an improvement. So, the contraction of the iris and the muscular movements of the eye are neither of them essential to vision, but only improvements which might have been added and perfected at any stage of the construction of the instrument. End quote. Within the highest division of the animal kingdom, namely the vertebrata, we can start from an eye so simple that it consists, as in the lancelet, of a little sack of transparent skin, furnished with a nerve and lined with pigment, but destitute of any other apparatus. In fishes and reptiles, as Owen has remarked, the range of gradation of dioptric structures in fishes and reptiles, as Owen has remarked, quote, the range of gradation of dioptric structures is very great, end quote. It is a significant fact that even in man, According to the high authority of Virchow, the beautiful crystalline lens is formed in the embryo by an accumulation of epidermic cells lying in a sac-like fold of the skin, and the vitreous body is formed from embryonic subcutaneous tissue. To arrive, however, at a just conclusion regarding the formation of the eye, with all its marvellous yet not absolutely perfect characters, it is indispensable that the reason should conquer the imagination, but I have felt the difficulty far too keenly to be surprised at others hesitating to extend the principle of natural selection to so startling a length. It is scarcely possible to avoid comparing the eye with a telescope. We know that this instrument has been perfected by the long, continued efforts of the highest human intellects, and we naturally infer that the eye has been formed by a somewhat analogous process, but may not this inference be presumptuous? 
have we any right to assume that the creator works by intellectual powers like those of man if we must compare the eye to an optical instrument we ought in imagination to take a thick layer of transparent tissue with spaces filled with fluid and with a nerve sensitive to light beneath and then suppose every part of this layer to be continually changing slowly in density so as to separate into layers of different densities and thicknesses placed at different distances from each other and with the surfaces of each layer slowly changing in form further we must suppose that there is a power represented by natural selection or the survival of the fittest always intently watching each slight alteration in the transparent layers and carefully preserving each which under varied circumstances in any way or degree tends to produce a distincter image we must suppose each new state of the instrument to be multiplied by the million each to be preserved until a better is produced and then the old ones to be all destroyed in living bodies variation will cause the slight alteration generation will multiply them almost infinitely and natural selection will pick out with unerring skill each improvement let this process go on for millions of years and during each year on millions of individuals of many kinds and may we not believe that a living optical instrument might thus be formed as superior to one of glass as the works of the creator are to those of man modes of transition if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications my theory would absolutely break down but i can find out no such case no doubt many organs exist of which we do not know the transitional grades more especially if we look to much isolated species around which according to the theory there has been much extinction or again if we take an organ common to all the members of a class for in this latter case the organ must have been originally formed at a remote period since which all the many members of the class have been developed and in order to discover the early transitional grades through which the organ has passed we should have to look to very ancient ancestral forms long since become extinct we should be extremely cautious in concluding that an organ could not have been formed by transitional gradations of some kind numerous cases could be given among the lower animals of the same organ performing at the same time wholly distinct functions thus in the larva of the dragonfly and in the fish cobites the alimentary canal respires digests and excretes in the hydra the animal may be turned inside out and the exterior surface will then digest and the stomach respire in such cases natural selection might specialize if any advantage were thus gained the whole or part of an organ which had previously performed two functions for one function alone and thus by insensible steps greatly change its nature many plants are known which regularly produce at the same time differently constructed flowers and if such plants were to produce one kind alone a great change would be effected with comparative suddenness in the character of the species it is however probable that the two sorts of flowers borne by the same plant were originally differentiated by finely graduated steps which may still be followed in some few cases again two distinct organs or the same organ under two very different forms may simultaneously perform in the same individual the same function and this is an extremely important means of transition to give one instance there are fish with gills or bronchi that breathe the air dissolved in the water at the same time that they breathe free air in their swim bladders this latter organ being divided by highly vascular partitions and having a ductus pneumaticus for the supply of air to give another instance from the vegetable kingdom plants climb by three distinct means by spirally twining 
by clasping a support with their sensitive tendrils, and by the emission of aerial rootlets. These three means are usually found in distinct groups, but some few species exhibit two of the means, or even all three, combined in the same individual. In all such cases, one of the two organs might readily be modified and perfected so as to perform all the work, being aided during the process of modification by the other organ, and then this other organ might be modified for some other and quite distinct purpose, or be wholly obliterated. The illustration of the swim bladder in fishes is a good one, because it shows us clearly the highly important fact that an organ originally constructed for one purpose, namely flotation, may be converted into one for a widely different purpose, namely respiration. The swim bladder has also been worked in as an accessory to the auditory organs of certain fishes. All physiologists admit that the swim bladder is homologous, or, quote, ideally similar, end quote, in position and structure with the lungs of the higher vertebrate animals. Hence there is no reason to doubt that the swim bladder has actually been converted into lungs, or an organ used exclusively for respiration. According to this view, it may be inferred that all vertebrate animals with true lungs are descended by ordinary generation from an ancient and unknown prototype which was furnished with a floating apparatus, or swim ladder. We can thus, as I infer from Professor Owen's interesting description of these parts, understand the strange fact that every particle of food and drink which we swallow has to pass over the orifice of the trachea, with some risk of falling into the lungs, notwithstanding the beautiful contrivance by which the glottis is closed. In the higher vertebrata, the bronchi have wholly disappeared, but in the embryo, the slits on the sides of the neck, and the loop-like course of the arteries, still mark their former position. But it is conceivable that the now utterly lost bronchi might have been gradually worked in by natural selection for some distinct purpose. For instance, Landois has shown that the wings of insects are developed from the trachea. It is therefore highly probable that in this great class, organs which once served for respiration have been actually converted into organs for flight. In considering transitions of organs, it is so important to bear in mind the probability of conversion from one function to another that I will give another instance. Pedunculated cirripedes have two minute folds of skin, called by me the ovigerous frena, which serve, through the means of a sticky secretion, to retain the eggs until they are hatched within the sac. These cirripedes have no bronchi, the whole surface of the body and of the sac, together with the small frena serving for respiration. The balanidae, or sessile cirripedes, on the other hand, have no ovigerous frena, the eggs lying loose at the bottom of the sac, within the well-enclosed shell. But they have, in the same relative position with the frena, large, much-folded membranes, which freely communicate with the circulatory lacuna of the sac and body, and which have been considered by all naturalists to act as bronchi. Now, I think no one will dispute that the ovigerous frena in the one family are strictly homologous with the bronchi of the other family. Indeed, they graduate into each other. Therefore, it need not be doubted that the two little folds of skin which originally served as ovigerous frena, but which likewise very slightly aided in the act of respiration, have been gradually converted by natural selection into bronchi, simply through an increase in their size and the obliteration of their adhesive glands. If all pedunculated cirripedes had become extinct, and they have suffered far more extinction than have sessile cirripedes, 
who would ever have imagined that the bronchi in this latter family had originally existed as organs for preventing the ova from being washed out of the sack there is another possible mode of transition namely through the acceleration or retardation of the period of reproduction this has lately been insisted on by professor cope and others in the united states it is now known that some animals are capable of reproduction at a very early age before they have acquired their perfect characters and if this power became thoroughly well developed in a species it seems probable that the adult stage of development would sooner or later be lost and in this case especially if the larva differed much from the mature form the character of the species would be greatly changed and degraded again not a few animals after arriving at maturity go on changing in character during nearly their whole lives with mammals for instance the form of the skull is often much altered with age of which dr murie has given some striking instances with seals every one knows how the horns of stags become more and more branched and the plumes of some birds become more finely developed as they grow older professor cope states that the teeth of certain lizards change much in shape with advancing years with crustaceans not only many trivial but some important parts assume a new character as recorded by fritz muller after maturity in all such cases and many could be given if the age for reproduction were retarded the character of the species at least in its adult state would be modified nor is it improbable that the previous and earlier stages of development would in some cases be hurried through and finally lost whether species have often or ever been modified through this comparatively sudden mode of transition i can form no opinion but if this has occurred it is probable that the differences between the young and the mature and between the mature and the old were primordially acquired by graduated steps special difficulties of the theory of natural selection although we must be extremely cautious in concluding that any organ could not have been produced by successive small transitional gradations yet undoubtedly serious cases of difficulty occur one of the most serious is that of neuter insects which are often differently constructed from either the males or fertile females but this case will be treated of in the next chapter the electric organs of fishes offer another case of special difficulty for it is impossible to conceive by what steps these wondrous organs have been produced but this is not surprising for we do not even know of what use they are in the gymnotus and torpedo they no doubt serve as powerful means of defence and perhaps for securing prey yet in the ray as observed by Matucci, an analogous organ in the tail manifests but little electricity even when the animal is greatly irritated so little that it can hardly be of any use for the above purposes moreover in the ray besides the organ just referred to there is as dr r macdonnell has shown another organ near the head not known to be electrical but which appears to be the real homologue of the electric battery in the torpedo it is generally admitted that there exists between these organs and ordinary muscle a close analogy in intimate structure in the distribution of the nerves and in the manner in which they are acted on by various reagents it should also be especially observed that muscular contraction is accompanied by an electrical discharge and as dr radcliffe insists quote, in the electrical apparatus of the torpedo during rest there would seem to be a charge in every respect like that which is met with in muscle and nerve during the rest and the discharge of the torpedo 
instead of being peculiar, may be only another form of the discharge which attends upon the action of muscle and motor nerve. End quote. Beyond this we cannot, at present, go in the way of explanation. But as we know so little about the uses of these organs, and as we know nothing about the habits and structure of the progenitors of the existing electric fishes, it would be extremely bold to maintain that no serviceable transitions are possible by which these organs might have been gradually developed. These organs appear at first to offer another and far more serious difficulty, for they occur in about a dozen kinds of fish, of which several are widely remote in their affinities. When the same organ is found in several members of the same class, especially if, in members having very different habits of life, we may generally attribute its presence to inheritance from a common ancestor, and its absence in some of the members to loss through disuse or natural selection. So that, if the electric organs had been inherited from some one ancient progenitor, we might have expected that all electric fishes would have been specially related to each other, but this is far from the case. Nor does geology at all lead to the belief that most fishes formerly possessed electric organs, which their modified descendants have now lost. But when we look at the subject more closely, we find in the several fishes provided with electric organs that these are situated in different parts of the body, that they differ in construction, as in the arrangement of the plates, and, according to Massini, in the process or means by which the electricity is excited, and, lastly, in being supplied with nerves proceeding from different sources, and this is perhaps the most important of all the differences. Hence, in the several fishes furnished with electric organs, these cannot be considered as homologous, but only as analogous in function. Consequently, there is no reason to suppose that they have been inherited from a common progenitor, for had this been the case, they would have closely resembled each other in all respects. Thus the difficulty of an organ, apparently the same, arising in several remotely allied species, disappears, leaving only the lesser yet still great difficulty, namely, by what graduated steps these organs have been developed in each separate group of fishes. The luminous organs, which occur in a few insects, belonging to widely different families, and which are situated in different parts of the body, offer, under our present state of ignorance, a difficulty almost exactly parallel with that of the electric organs. Other similar cases could be given. For instance, in plants, the very curious contrivance of a mass of pollen grains, born on a footstalk with an adhesive gland, is apparently the same in Orcus and Asclepius. Genera almost as remote as is possible among flowering plants, but here again the parts are not homologous. In all cases of beings far removed from each other in the scale of organization, which are furnished with similar and peculiar organs, it will be found that although the general appearance and function of the organs may be the same, yet fundamental differences between them can always be detected. For instance, the eyes of cephalopods, or cuttlefish, and of vertebrate animals appear wonderfully alike, and in such widely sundered groups no part of this resemblance can be due to inheritance from a common progenitor. Mr. Myvart has advanced this case as one of special difficulty, but I am unable to see the force of his argument. An organ for vision must be formed of a transparent tissue, and must include some sort of lens for throwing an image at the back of a darkened chamber. Beyond this superficial resemblance, there is hardly any real similarity between the eyes of the cuttlefish and vertebrates 
as may be seen by consulting hence's admirable memoir on these organs in the cephalopoda it is impossible for me here to enter on details but i may specify a few of the points of difference the crystalline lens in the higher cuttlefish consists of two parts placed one behind the other like two lenses both having a very different structure and disposition to what occurs in the vertebrata the retina is wholly different with an actual inversion of the elemental parts and with a large nervous ganglion included within the membranes of the eye the relations of the muscles are as different as it is possible to conceive and so in other points hence it is not a little difficult to decide how far even the same terms ought to be employed in describing the eyes of the cephalopoda and vertebrata it is of course open to any one to deny that the eye in either case could have been developed through natural selection of successive slight variations but if this be admitted in the one case it is clearly possible in the other and fundamental differences of structure in the visual organs of two groups might have been anticipated in accordance with this view of their manner of formation as two men have sometimes independently hit on the same invention so in the several foregoing cases it appears that natural selection working for the good of each being and taking advantage of all favorable variations has produced similar organs as far as function is concerned in distinct organic beings which owe none of their structure in common to inheritance from a common progenitor fritz muller in order to test the conclusions arrived at in this volume has followed out with much care a nearly similar line of argument several families of crustaceans include a few species possessing an air-breathing apparatus and fitted to live out of the water in two of these families which were more especially examined by muller and which are nearly related to each other the species agree most closely in all important characters namely in their sense organs circulating systems in the positions of the tufts of hair within their complex stomachs and lastly in the whole structure of the water-breathing bronchi even to the microscopical hooks by which they are cleansed hence it might have been expected that in the few species belonging to both families which live on the land the equally important air-breathing apparatus would have been the same for why should this one apparatus given for the same purpose have been made to differ while all the other important organs were closely similar or rather identical fritz Smaller argues that this close similarity in so many points of structure must in accordance with the views advanced by me be accounted for by inheritance from a common progenitor but as the vast majority of the species in the above two families as well as most other crustaceans are aquatic in their habits it is improbable in the highest degree that their common progenitor should have been adapted for breathing air muller was thus led carefully to examine the apparatus in the air-breathing species and he found it to differ in each several important points as in the position of the orifices in the manner in which they are opened and closed and in some accessory details now such differences are intelligible and might even have been expected on the supposition that species belonging to distinct families had slowly become to adapt it to live more and more out of water and to breathe the air for these species from belonging to distinct families would have differed to a certain extent and in accordance with the principle that the nature of each variation depends on two factors viz the nature of the organism and that of the surrounding conditions 
their variability assuredly would not have been exactly the same consequently natural selection would have had different materials or variations to work on in order to arrive at the same functional result and the structures thus acquired would almost necessarily have differed on the hypothesis of separate acts of creation the whole case remains unintelligible this line of argument seems to have had great weight in leading fritz muller to accept the views maintained by me in this volume another distinguished zoologist the late professor Claparede, has argued in the same manner and has arrived at the same result he shows that there are parasitic mites a caridine, belonging to distinct subfamilies and families which are furnished with hair claspers these organs must have been independently developed as they could not have been inherited from a common progenitor and in the several groups they are formed by the modification of the forelegs of the hind legs of the maxillae or lips and of appendages on the under side of the hind part of the body End of chapter 6, part 1